What I'm going to do is um, I'm writing a review article with some people in the room here on ambrosia beetle and bark beetle associated diseases on trees around the world. And it, Yuri published something back in 2011 that uh, touched on this subject and brought up some of the very important points that we're going to reiterate in this article and then I'll reiterate today in the, during this talk. Um, very serious problems. And my hope in this brief 20 minute talk is that I'll give you some broad perspectives on how diverse these problems are, how diverse the fungal pathogens are that are involved, the types of symptoms that they cause, the types of hosts that are affected, and the geographic distributions. And basically just to sensitize yourself to the subsequent talks in this session and the bigger picture about these are really important problems that are arising now around the world. Uh, as Yuri pointed out and other people have, have alluded to, these are really unexpected problems because of the unusual um, uh, behaviors of the vectors. Again, ambrosia beetles usually go to dead or dying trees. And when you're talking about a disease situation, the implication there automatically is that these vectors are going to healthy trees. So that in itself is unusual. The other unusual thing is that these symbionts, these nutritional symbionts that these insects have an obligate uh, relationship with, are usually saprobes, and they usually colonize just that natal gallery, and that's pretty much it. The real unusual thing here is that we've got some phytopathogens here that cause disease on trees, so not expected at all. Due to these uncommon attributes, then, uh, this is a, these are unexpected situations, and uh, despite that, uh, they are uh, their impacts in uh, landscape situations, natural environments, and in agriculture and in forest tree production are really profound. These are just some examples here, and I'll, uh, my good friend and colleague from Florida, Jason, wanted to make sure that I pointed out, first of all, for laurel wilt, which is up here, this was, used to be a, almost a monoculture of very large red bay, Percy brobonia in southern Georgia, and it shows what this disease did in a very short time span. It's basically wiped out in that stand all of the red bays. This has happened throughout the entire southeastern coastal plain of the United States. And we're trying to put our, our heads together and come up with you know, a figure. Jason's feeling, and he's probably right, is that for the 10 years that this disease has been known, it's probably the most damaging tree disease that's been known. Hundreds, tens of millions of, of trees have been killed in 10 years. Um, here's a situation down here with avocado. We've heard about it. There are two other raphilia incited diseases in Asia, Japanese oak wheat wilt and Korean oak wilt. There is a, a disease in um, New Zealand, a nothophagus and eucalyptus and some other trees that's incited by a sporothrix. Very unusual, but it's uh, vectored by some platypoded vectors. And uh, Yuri mentioned this, this fusarium canker situation on black walnut and tulip poplar and some other trees in nursery type situations in the United States. So these are just some examples. Uh, this is a table that I've gleaned from this, this manuscript that we're working on, but it just shows the long list of uh, tree species that are impacted or affected by ambrosia beetles, and then if you'll look closely at this Leach's Rules column here, uh, Leach was a, a, a tree pathologist, published a book back in 1940, and he basically established some principles that were needed to determine whether or not a, a pathogen was as actually associated with and vectored by a, an insect and arthropod. And um, with those things met then, you could say reliably that uh, this was an um, ambrosia beetle vectored uh, pathogen and disease of, of, of tree XYZ. For some of these situations, uh, up here there's a eucalyptus situation, ambrosiella is the symbiont. There's not good information that that thing causes any damage at all. However, for a lot of these here, uh, there's very good information that the damage that's caused on these hosts is caused by this not just by the fungus and not just by the beetle, but this combination. That's very important. In most of these situations, you need that tag team to kill trees and do serious damage. 
Um, I'm not an entomologist, but just the reading I've done, this group of insects, the beetles, is really diverse. Lots and lots of different beetles, lots of different sizes and shapes. Uh, just out of uh, interest here, the CD down here is for Charles Darwin. This is a beetle that he collected back when he was on the Beagle. Bark beetles that are related to ambrosia beetles are flown feeders. And we look at this uh, uh, feral article. This is uh, not current, but what he showed back in 2001 is that there were, at that time, seven examples of ambrosia beetles that had evolved from bark beetles. I think, Yuri, the figure you gave was 11 examples now. But the, the key thing here is that bark beetles are ancestral. They um, usually arose on gymnosperms, on conifers, and the, the change that's taken place is that ambrosia beetles, uh, rather than colonizing the phloem, colonize the xylem, and that shift usually has been associated also with going to uh, angiosperms. Now, if we superimpose upon this pathogenic symbionts, not just the symbionts, but the, the symbionts that have been shown to be pathogens on trees, you can see it spread throughout this uh, relationship here. So all the yellow ones are bark beetles, and these are uh, species or genera of bark beetle-associated tree pathogens. And then the corresponding in, in uh, um, burgundy down here are ambrosia beetles and the pathogens that are associated with them. If we turn that around and look at this phylogeny from the uh, uh, paper that Kerry O'Donnell showed in his paper uh, talk this morning, um, with the exception of the Fusarium species and Geosmithia morbida, this pathogen that causes this thousand cankers disease, those are in the Hippocorelli, Hippocorelli, yeah. they're in a different order. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other ones are in, either in the Opistomateles or the Microascales, and again, if you superimpose upon them, the corresponding vectors, they're all over the place. There's no real consistent relationship that I can discern out of that. Okay, the, the amount of disease then that is, that is associated with beetle activities varies greatly. And uh, for an ambrosia beetle associated uh, damage that occurs, the mortality, there's significant to no association with these symbionts. So the, the worst case scenario is this laurel wilt, this disease that I and, and Jorge and, and Daniel and others in the room work on, uh, where systemic and lethal disease development occurs after a single infection. Uh, we think what happens is that the, the vector Xyloborus glabratus, the female is confused, she goes to a healthy tree, assuming that she can establish a brood in it, does not establish a brood in it, but in that one initial interaction, that's sufficient then to infect the tree with the pathogen, and it's off to the races. Um, and this is, again, uh, red bay over here, um, naturally or experimentally here. Uh, this is another example of what's happened in, uh, in Florida. This entire sand dune used to be covered with red bay. They're all dead now. Uh, this is what's happened experimentally in avocado. This is uh, north of the uh, commercial production areas in, in Florida. And then, unfortunately for us in Dane County, where we're interested in commercial production, this is what's happening now. In commercial avocado production, this is coming into orchards, killing trees, and that pathogen, that disease is moving via root grafts. A very scary situation. Uh, another single example that I'm aware of, of a uh, phytopathogenic fungus that's associated with an ambrosia beetle that kills trees is this nothophagi, or this um, Sporothrix nothophagi in New Zealand, where this, a single inoculation with this fungus as well will kill trees. Um, an unusual situation, it, it, rather than xyloborines, these are two plata, three platypoded vectors that are involved there and trees are killed. At the other, so if we, we look at the, the spectrum, if we look at one end where we've got laurel wilt, you know, systemic infection, kills trees rapidly. At the other end are ambrosia beetles that apparently uh, interact with trees and damage trees without any uh, impact of the symbiont. 
Uh, and there are a few examples in the literature. There aren't many, but there are some. Uh, I've listed them here, and the one I'm going to key on is this Megaplatypus mutatus uh, down here. It's been renamed recently. A uh, huge host range. Uh, this thing is causing real serious damage in, in South America now. It's in Europe causing damage to pomaceous uh, fruit trees and poplar and a lot of other things. And in the literature, all the literature that I've seen, it never mentions disease. Uh, recently, however, I've come across pictures like this, which to me as a plant pathologist, I look at this and go, holy smokes, that looks like disease. This is poplar. This should be white on the inside. Um, another example, there's a paper recently out of Columbia, another ambrosia beetle. And in that paper are, and these are really bad pictures, I apologize, but associated with that ambrosia beetle is a ceratocystis species. Inoculated trees on ulnus cause this type of symptom, and then another fusarium, fusarium solani, causes that type of damage. So, again, one of my pleas in my talk is let's keep an open mind on this and say you know, some of these situations perhaps there might be a disease interaction. Typically, when, when healthy trees are killed in these situations, um, the uh, the pathogens are moderately virulent. They're not like Raphaelia lauricola, where you have systemic, bang, kills a tree dead. What typically happens is the pathogens are moderately pathogenic, and you need mass attack by the, the vectors. And these include uh, scolited fusarium interactions, and again, the disease we're talking about at this meeting is a really good example of that. Um, I had this impression before I came here, and all I saw yesterday reinforced that idea that this pathogen is not a really good pathogen. It causes some necrosis in the tree, but it really needs this insect to mass attack that tree, and together the insect and the fungus are what kills trees. Uh, Platypoda interactions too, and the good examples here are these two Asian oak wilts. These are two Raphelia species in, in Asia. We've got a, a, a colleague here from Japan somewhere. Um, and this is the type of damage that is showing up in Japan now, where at least three different species of Quercus are being killed. Um, this is the vector up here, and unlike the Raphelia lauricula situation where you get one infection going systemic and killing trees, here you get localized necrosis. Uh, what's clear here and also, whoops, okay, I want to go backwards, yeah. With the Korean oak wilt is that you need lots of attacks by the beetle, lots of infections by these fungi in order to kill trees. Okay, uh, the $64 question is why are we seeing more of these happen around the world? I don't think anybody has a really uh, take to the bank good answer for that, but we have some ideas. Uh, something that's been suggested in Asia for these Asian oak wilts is climate change. Uh, and the uh, Japanese researchers and now the Koreans as well feel that with climate change, global warming, the effective geographic distribution and range of these vectors has changed to overlap with some previously unencountered host trees. Uh, underpinning this and some of the other comments I'm going to make are these new encounters. Um, new encounter biology just simply means that uh, the two components in a sit, uh, situation do not have an evolutionary history. So for these tree diseases, it's a real serious problem. I mean, I, I work with a lot of diseases of tropical fruit crops, and there are many examples of this, where you take a pathogen from one area of the world, you introduce it to another, it meets a new host. The new host has no co-evolved resistance, and it go, goes belly up. Um, I think a good example of this is this laurel wilt. You know, we've got good information. We knew all along that this beetle uh, had been reported from several areas in southern Asia. And then Tom Harrington recently with Steve Frederick, uh, with collaborators in Japan and Taiwan, got cadavers of these beetles and showed conclusively that not only was the beetle there, but this pathogen was in those beetles, was in the mycangium of these beetles that he had gotten from Asia. 
So because the uh, beetle had not been reported before in the Western Hemisphere until 2002, and we had no in, uh, indication that there was a laurel wilt type disease in our area, I think it's pretty good circumstantial evidence that in 2002, um, this combination, the beetle and the pathogen, came to uh, Georgia and uh, encountered these new radically susceptible hosts, uh, red bay, swamp bay, all these other American loraceous trees that had no resistance to this disease whatsoever. What, what's, what, what are some of the things that might be responsible here for these interactions? Yuri in this paper back in 2011 suggested that there might be olfactory miscues where these insects are hardwired to identify trees in which the female can establish broods and she's confused somehow. She goes to this new encounter tree, thinks it's a potential brood tree when in fact it's not. So to me that sounds logical as a, a logical hypothesis. I think the absence of this co-evolved uh, resistance. There are examples for tree pathology, um, Dutch elm disease, for instance. You go to Asia, the putative home of those pathogens, Ophiostoma pathogens, those Asiatic elms are very resistant to that disease. Um, chestnut blight. Uh, Chinese chestnut is very resistant to that pathogen, and that pathogen came from Asia. So I think for, for a lot of these ambrosia beetle associated situations, there's no co-evolved um, resistance in these new counter areas, but if you go back to the homelands, and these are hypotheses we can test later on, the Laurasia stuff in Asia should be more resistant than, than the stuff in the Americas. And we've got one example of that, but again, more work needs to be done. Uh, predisposing factors also probably involved. And, uh, the situation in New Zealand, uh, they noted that the drought uh, stress was uh, uh, pretty seriously interacted with the damage that they saw on North of Vegas there. Uh, these nursery situations that uh, Yuri alluded to, there's some predisposing factors there as well. Where you get these monocultures of a susceptible host of a uniform size. He mentioned uh, overwatering. Um, some of the papers that I've seen too talked about if you uh, have a lot of uh, trash that is infested with these beetles and you have high populations of these beetles, um, you're, you're asking for problems. And then what about uh, changes in the pathogen? Uh, we know nothing about this, but some of the, the things that have been suggested in other similar situations are increased virulence or fitness of the fungus. Uh, and this might constitute either evolution of the pathogen from one area to another, hybridization, uh, a selection of rare or pre-existing genotypes. We, again, early days on this, we just don't know. So we're trying to figure out, wrap our heads around, why are these weird situations popping up? And I'm just gonna finish up here with a possibilities for this Ulasi situation in that uh, the simple story might be that we have a uniform beetle and a uniform fungus in the Indian subcontinent and it's been moved around the world. For anybody who's been in this room and been listening, it, the evidence we have so far, it, even though it's been a matter of months that we've been looking at this, is that that's probably not the case. We probably have cryptic speciation going on within the fungus and also within the, uh, the insect. So if you've got cryptic species within uh, the Indian subcontinent, are we selecting then, or are these portions of these populations that have many different cryptic species, are they being then disseminated to different areas? Is one cryptic species going to Israel? We know that that one there is definitely not Fusarium ambrosium, it's Fusarium sp, it's a new species. Is it the same one that's found in California? Don't know. Uh, might be a different species of the beetle in those areas as well that may reside in those Indian subcontinent areas or not, we don't know. In Florida, um, I know from the work that Kerry has just done, our fungal component is different. Would that be found in the Indian subcontinent? Uh, if we looked hard enough, we don't know. Where did it come from? Um, and the beetle. Uh, apparently our beetle is different from the one that's found in Israel and California, but it's similar to one that um, people here at UC Riverside have looked at from Sri Lanka and Australia. 
So a lot of questions here. Or is evolution occurring? Are we, you know, did Fusarium ambrosium get moved to Israel and did it evolve into something else? I think that's a little bit far-fetched, but we don't know. Likewise for the Florida and Australia situation. So what can be done? Um, I don't have time to talk about that now. Um, at the end of the session, we're going to have a half an hour where I'm going to give just some slides of, you know, what ifs, maybe type thing, and hopefully those will provoke um, discussion in the audience. Um, please stay for the rest of the session. Uh, thanks to postdocs and students and some people in the audience are actually in this picture. This is a team effort and I think I've got some time for, for questions. If anybody's got questions, but if not, we'll go to Dave. Any, any questions? You know, even though it only takes one. Ambrose beetle beta female. I think a lot of these things are really kind of low probability events but we're just doing it so many times in so many places that I think we're just, I mean, I guess if I have to weigh down on some of the novel combinations, we're just bringing in, it is hate to think of how many are coming across and not making it. Yeah. And that we're getting the real bad ones. Yeah. Um, the idea that um, in the, um, that, kind of there's this evolved coexistence between the beetles and the hosts at the point of origin argues that you believe they attack living hosts and that these are not beetles that are coming here that had kind of the behavior most sibmaters have of going into a dead host. I, well, hold on, hold that thought. I'm not <laughs> arguing that. I'm thinking based on what Tom said, I think those are still rare events in those homeland environments, but you only need you only need that one rare event to have disease say, if you don't have resistance to this symbiont, you're dead. No, no, that's, that's not saying that there's co-evolved resistance in the point of origin. That would involve um, selective pressure. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't get the connection between two very different types of host colonization behaviors. Um, I, I don't get the connection because, I mean, that really implies in the homeland that you're looking at something that attacks living, living trees, if you're going to have co-evolved resistance in the homeland, not just an accidental encounter, encounter here and there. I don't agree with that at all. I think what you hap have happened is it's not, I'm not arguing that the behavior of these beetles in Asia is different and that they routinely go to healthy trees. What we're seeing now with Daniel's talk, for instance, is a lot of these would not be associated usually with attacking healthy trees, but you don't need 90% of the population to go to healthy trees. Probably 1% is sufficient to exert significant selection pressure on that host population. Is there a possibility that the behavior of these beetles is different when, uh, with different substrate avail availability? In other words, say you have a wide open amount of monogenetic substrate they just love, like Acer Nagundo. Does their behavior, might it change their behavior, their biochemistry, in response to that huge amount of substrate available versus, uh, say, when the substrate's not available and they're in a situation where in their native lands where everything has a resistance or their population is at a certain uh, amount of density to where it's lower and are there signals that can be, or triggers that could be utilized as control methods that would change their behavior for those different conditions? I, I'm not sure, I you're talking about the beetle behavior or? Right, is there a possibility the behavior of the beetle is different in a situation where you have a huge amount of substrate available and you have a huge explosion of population? I'm not an entomologist, but from what we've seen here so far, if they're, you got a bunch of beetles and they're looking for something to feed on, you're going to expose them to pressure that they probably wouldn't normally see. But an uh, entomologist should answer that question. I was, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, there are some reports that are for some 
bug beetles, secondary bug beetles, uh, they tend to attack healthy living trees when the population density is high. So probably similar situations is happening in Japan because uh, according to my experience in Southeastern Asian countries, uh, where no uh, Japanese oak wilt incidences, uh, the insect attacks only dead trees or fallen trees or broken branches. But in, in Japan, it's apparently that they attack healthy living trees. So probably their behavior will change according to the population densities. So this is one possibility. But uh, I'm not sure about the Turinga. Turinga means a real, re, real cause of the, uh, what, what is a driving force. Okay. Um, let's, let's hold questions. We got, we got half an hour at the end of the session. And with that, I'll introduce Dave. And